Good morning, everyone. Uh, good, uh, welcome to uh, today's live stream. Another live stream. We're at Wednesday already. It's it is always a wonder to me how fast the weeks go when when since we've been doing the live streams, which has been since about mid May. It just flies by. I don't know what it is, but I guess it's gonna be Friday before we know it. But uh, today today's gonna be interesting. I, I think today's gonna be a really an interesting one because within Scripture, we actually have two different descriptions of how we enter the family of God, maybe, if that's what they're talking about. But within scripture, we have, we have, of course, the probably the more familiar teaching that we are born again, that we actually, you know, we were once born, we needed to be born again, born of spirit. And that's how we enter the family of God. We're born into his family. Uh, the other one that shows up just a couple of times actually talks about us being adopted, adopted. So I guess my question is, are we born or are we adopted? Because can you be both? Can you be, you know, if we, if we look at just, just a human structure for a family, and I'm not sure that's a perfect example because we're dealing with spiritual things here, but let's, let's just look at a human structure. I'm the biological son of my father and mother. Can they then adopt me? I was born into this family. So I'm a Ryan. My last name's Ryan. I'm, I'm a Ryan, flesh and blood. But then can my parents also then turn around and adopt me? Uh, I don't, I don't think so. I think you can be one or the other. But scripture says both. So what are we to make of this? Are we born or are we adopted? And I thought we could kick that around this morning. Just just let's bounce this off each other. Let's look at the scriptures that talk about this and see if we can um, we can come to a conclusion here. Which one is it? So uh, to start out, I wanted to, to point out a couple things here. For one thing, uh, kind of the, the first part of this, the idea of being adopted, adopted into God's family, or, or if, if that's what he's saying, that the... the um, the adoption to sonship, that's the official phrase that shows up in scripture. Um, that's a Paul exclusive. Paul is the only person that says that, ad, um, ad, receiving the adoption to sonship. It's only Paul. The next element of that is Paul never uses the phrase born again. Uh, that is John who records Jesus saying that, and later on John says it too. So that you, um, John, Jesus, and then Peter use the phrase born again. Uh, Paul does not use that now, his, his theology is not um, contrary to being born again. It actually really supports it. He, he teaches a death and a resurrection as, as what, what it would be to, be to exit Adam and to enter Christ. Um, you die. You die in Adam. You die. You're crucified with Christ. You're buried with him. You're raised again a new creation um, in holiness and righteousness of the truth. You're like Jesus. The, the sin that you had was nailed to the cross, gone, never to be seen again. Uh, that's what Paul teaches. So therefore, if anyone is in Christ, Paul says he is a new creation. The old is gone. The body ruled by sin is done away with, he says. The new has come. But he doesn't really use born again. He doesn't really use that. And this could be, and this is, this is my opinion on it. Um, it I, well, this is, this is really history on it. And this could be why he doesn't use it. The Gospel of John was written a great deal later, so Paul was probably, by the time that John hit bookstore shelves, uh, Paul was all, probably already gone. He was probably already had been executed. That's the, the story with Paul, that he was executed in the AD 60s in Rome. We don't know that that's true. That's kind of a legend, but he does, we do stop hearing from him after a time, so it kind of seems that, that, that could, there could be some truth to that. It's believed that John and 1 John um, were written in the, about the 90s. Um, AD. So they come much, much later. He may not have been familiarized with the phrase born again. That's what I mean by that, because he, he might not have read that. He might not have, have thought of it that way. He might not have put those words together. That could be why he never uses that. So uh, although Jesus had said it a long time ago, uh, perhaps Paul was not familiar with it. So what does Paul say here? Um, well, actually, let me let me scoot this before I spill it. I want to talk a little bit about adoption. So if, if we're, we got, we got two, two, two options here. We're born into the family of God or we're adopted, uh, one or the other. And I don't, I mean, we're going to try to figure out how those might work together. But, 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 if we're adopted, let's say, let's go with that one. If we're adopted into God's family, then we still have a relationship with Adam, don't we? Because we're, we would be Adam's children. We're born into Adam's family. We're born into that, born of, of flesh and blood into Adam's family. God adopts us, meaning he changes our legal status. That's really what adoption would be. He changes our last name. He changes our legal status. Uh, but 
um, we still have a relationship with Adam because we never died. And, and, and the idea of us being adopted, we never really died. We weren't reborn. Um, we're not a new creation. We're actually the same. We've just had our last name changed. Um, you know, we've just had our, our status changed, but we're really still in Adam. So I'm not sure that that works with everything else we have in Scripture. Being born into the family of God definitely works with everything else we have. So that being said, let's examine these mentions of adoption to sonship in Scripture and see if we can decipher some of this. Let me pull it up here. Okay. So the first time this shows up is actually in the book of Romans. <laughs> um, we're going to go. There's five mentions of this, uh, all from Paul. Uh, these, the, you'll see when we start going in. These are, these, the way that he uses these are, is confusing. I don't know if that even does it justice, the way that he uses these, these phrases. But I, I, think we can, I think we can knock these out. So the first time he uses this is actually in Romans chapter 8. And he talks, let me pull up the context here. Okay, so starting in verse 14, he says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Now that's us. So we, we know this is talking about us. But then he goes on and he says, the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. There's that phrase. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So this really sounds like this is us being brought into the family of God. I mean, we're calling out Abba Father. That's a term of endearment. Uh, that really sounds like that's what he's talking about there. But he's using adoption, which, I, like I said, I think that's a little contrary to everything else we have. That, that doesn't really change who we are. Uh, that just changes the status of us. That's more or less, I think, adoption would be a lot more comfortable for someone who's a little bit of a more of a legalistic mindset than being born. Because if you're adopted, we could do the whole thing with the sinner and the sinful nature, and you have to fight off the flesh. Because you didn't really change, you changed statuses. But you're still really who you always were. Um, you still have a relationship with Adam. Who knows what that would look like? I mean, is, is, this a, is it a closed adoption? Does Adam get you on the weekends every other holiday? I mean, how, how does that work? You know, you're kind of sharing custody a little bit with, with adoption. But really, that is kind of what it sounds like the way that, that Paul's saying this, it really kind of sounds like that. So, um, you know, the spirit you received does not make you a slave. It, it brought about your adoption to sonship. He brought about your adoption to sonship. By him, we cry out, Abba, Father. Okay. So now let's look at the next mention and see if we can interpret this um, a little bit. And it almost sounds completely different the next time we see this, okay? So let me pull up the context. He says, now we know the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship. Now, I thought we had it because he, he said this just a couple verses back that um, we, our adoption to sonship has been already been brought about. But now he's saying we wait for it eagerly um, along with the creation. Uh, and he says the adoption of sonship is the redemption of our bodies, meaning that even though we're new from the inside out, the outside is still not new. We still have an Adamic body that is aging. It is aging, but it's going to be regenerated. You know, really, that's the last thing to happen. Our spirit's already been changed. Our heart's been changed. It's really just a physical body needs to be changed. We have a, I mean, if, if this earthly tent is destroyed, we have a home um, in heaven from God and imperishable. So that's what it's saying, but he's calling that adoption to sonship, which I'm like, Paul, why? Why do this to us? Um, so it's, but he, he keeps going with it. So, so we have that. So we have, to, we have to kind of weigh that a little bit too, that it's used to describe our bodies being regenerated, okay? It's used to describe receiving the Holy Spirit. That's the first way it's used. The Spirit we received brought about our adoption to sonship. The second way it's used is to talk about a regeneration of our physical bodies. Okay, so let's move into definition number three here. Uh, where did I do with this? Okay, right here. Okay, so now here's where this gets really interesting, okay? So Romans, the end of Romans, is all about how Israel is not going to ascend. Israel's not going to ascend because they've rejected Jesus Christ. And he's going on and on about that, and he's explaining how the law would never save them. They pursued God as if he was based, if he could be found by works, if he was obtainable by works. That's how they pursued him. And uh, look, I mean, it's a hopeless situation. And he's talking about exactly what you just mentioned there, uh, Manuel, about being grafted in. And he's talking about Israel's been cut off. 
We, the Gentiles, have been grafted in. We've been grafted in. We're in Israel's place. But if Israel repents and they believe in the Messiah, they'll be grafted back in again. The door's open. But for now, they've been cut off. They've experienced a hardening due to unbelief. They do not believe in Jesus, okay? But here's where we get another interesting use of adoption to sonship. And we're talking about Israel now. This is all about Israel, okay? And he says here, pull up the context. I want to get these in context. It just helps a little bit. All right, so he's talking about himself. And he says, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off for, from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. So that's who we're talking about. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. Okay, so now we have three definitions, all right up, all right up next to each other. The first one, the first definition of adoption to sonship is receiving the Holy Spirit. That's the first one. The second one is a regeneration of our physical bodies. In the third one, he says Israel has this. So that's really confusing. These don't play together. Israel does not have the Holy Spirit. If they did, he wouldn't write the rest of everything he wrote in Romans about Israel. Because they, they wouldn't be a problem. If they had the Holy Spirit, the only way that the Holy Spirit comes to rest on anyone is if they believe that Jesus is who he says he is. That he is the Son of God, which Israel doesn't believe. So what are you doing to us here, Paul? Like, what is this? Um, but he, he keeps going. So that's three definitions. All right, we got three definitions so far of the same thing. But let's continue because there's more. <clears throat> so, okay. So then to go down here, the next time he mentions this is actually in Galatians. Now, we would have to keep in mind that this is actually the first time he mentions it because Galatians actually was written before Romans. So this is actually the first time it's mentioned, but we're going to get a little bit of a different definition again. But I'll keep reminding us of what these definitions are and we'll see if we can kind of put this puzzle together. Uh, but but um, here's, the, here's another definition. This comes from Galatians 4, 5, okay? Let me pull up the context once again. That's something I love about Bible Gateway. When you do keyword searches, you can press in context and it'll pull up the verses around it. It just helps us understand a little bit better like where the author's mind is at when they're writing this versus just pulling out a little fragment and um, proof texting, which is a favorite. But anyway, uh, going on here, talking about, let's go actually, let's read the whole opening of chapter four here. Um, he's talking about the law. You know, the whole the whole thing with Galatians is trying to argue that the law is something that should never be mixed with the gospel. It's the whole book. How we get around that is a church. I have no idea. This is telling us not to do everything we're doing, and we still do it. So how that works, no one will ever know. But we have we have six chapters that scream, "Don't mix the law with grace," and then we read those and we mix the law with grace. But that's the whole argument here. So he starts in chapter four and he says, what I am saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different than a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. Then he goes on and he says, so also when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. He's talking about the Jews in their enslavement to the law. That's what he's talking about there. And he's saying like the word, we're, we're an heir, but you know, we're no different because we're underage. We have guardians, we have trustees. We're not the managers of any of this. So we're pretty much in a helpless situation. But then he says in verse four, but when the time set had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive the adoption to sonship. Okay, now I thought he said that the Jews already had the adoption to sonship. He said, theirs is the adoption to sonship. But he's talking about this here, and he's saying that we might get it. Uh, you know, if, when Jesus came, we might, we might receive this adoption to sonship. But then he goes on and he says, but because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who cries out, Abba, Father. That's extremely similar to what he says in Romans. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are God's child, you are also his heir. Okay. So there's another definition, kind of. It talks about receiving the Holy Spirit. It's extra interesting because it's talking about Israel needed to do this. So let's try to stitch this, this together. We have four different definitions, okay? So this, just to go back to the top here, uh, let me back up a page here and we'll grab these. And I'm, I'm going to give us a refresher and then we'll, we'll see if we can make sense of this. So the first one is saying, that this is Romans 8.15, says that the adoption to sonship is receiving the Holy Spirit. That's the first one. 
So that's the adoption of sonship, is that re you receive the Holy Spirit. The next one is a completely different definition, and it actually, this is Romans 8.23, so just a few verses later, says the adoption of sonship is the regeneration of your physical body. Kind of a different, kind of a different definition. Romans 9.4 says Israel, under the Old Covenant, already had the adoption to sonship. They already had received that. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. But we know that can't be talking about the Holy Spirit because they didn't have him. They were, they were hardened in unbelief. They never believed in Jesus. So that's something else. And then in Galatians, it's talking about that Jesus came to redeem those under the law so that they might be adopted to sonship. So this is confusing. This is an enigma. Um, he's saying the Israelites needed to be adopted to sonship. That's why Jesus came. Romans says they already were. Okay, so hopefully we're thoroughly confused on all of that with all these different definitions. They're conflicting. So here's what I think. I'm going to give you my opinion on this, okay? I think there's two different types of adoption to sonship. I think that's the only way that I could wrap my head around how we explain this. First of all, I think we have to define adoption to sonship. Adoption to sonship, I do not believe is talking about the family of God at all. I believe it's talking about Abraham's family. So if we, if we look at this as the family of Abraham, and that's the sonship that we're receiving, that might make a lot more sense. It might make a lot more sense why Israel both had it and needed to receive it. What we find in Scripture is that Abraham's promise, the Holy Spirit, is, is what the blessing. So God says to Abraham, I will, I will surely bless you and all your, descent, um, all your descendants. Um, it's going to, these promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, Scripture says. But the seed is Christ. Christ is the seed of Abraham through whom the blessing comes. The blessing is actually the Holy Spirit. Galatians says that. The blessing that was promised to Abraham, he didn't know that. When, when Abraham received this promise, he never knew it was the Holy Spirit. He had, he had honestly not a clue. Uh, he, he didn't know what any of this was, but his blessing was the Holy Spirit, and it does come to all of his descendants. Um, so, two definitions of adoption to sonship. The first one is being a physical descendant of Abraham. So, when Paul says in Romans 9.4, there, speaking of the people of Israel, theirs is the adoption of sonship, the divine glory, the covenants, plural, meaning Mosaic and Abrahamic, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Uh, those were first given to Israel, but Israel would not believe in God. That has been their problem since day one. They would not believe in him. They still don't to this day. Now they've rejected Jesus Christ. There are, of course, there are, of course, descendants of Abraham, physical descendants of Abraham that have accepted Jesus. There's Jews for Jesus. There's many Jews that do acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah. But really, overall, Israel is still experiencing that hardening that, that's talked about in these chapters of Romans. So, but they did receive adoption to sonship Abrahams. They are the physical descendants of Abraham. They are. But what we know from this same chapter, let me pull it up here. He starts in verse 6, and he starts explaining this, and he says, It's not as if God's word has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they Abraham's children. So they received the adoption to sonship. They were physically descendants of Abraham. But like so many things in the Old Testament, that is a model that is pointing to a reality. The actual adoption of sonship is receiving the Holy Spirit having the faith of Abraham. That's how we're actually children of Abraham. You, I, all of us Gentiles in the flesh um, are actually Abraham's children because we believed in Jesus. Understand then, Paul says, that those who have faith are the children of Abraham. He says that in Galatians. The true adoption to sonship is receiving the Holy Spirit. The model was being a physical descendant of Abraham. That's what the Israelites had. But that's why... When Paul says that Christ was born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that they might receive the adoption of sonship, he's talking about the real one, receiving the Holy Spirit, the true adoption of sonship, receiving Abraham's promise. Abraham's promise, the Holy Spirit, the blessing that was going to come by Abraham, only comes to his children. But it doesn't matter if you're physically descended from Abraham. That's not, that doesn't, that has no weight whatsoever. It's his spiritual children. This is a spiritual matter. The true adoption to sonship is receiving the Holy Spirit. The model is what Israel had. 
was being a physical descendant of Abraham. They never received his blessing. Hebrews says that. Abraham didn't receive it. None of them received it. Um, they all were living by faith when they died. Not all of them, really, because this is just talking about select people. The Israelites, in general, were living by unbelief when they died. But we don't have a hall of unbelief. That would be kind of comical if we did a little bit. I mean, not like... It, it would, in, in a sense, not like we should laugh and point or anything, but like, really, the, the hall of faith is, is small. The hall of unbelief could fill up the whole book because that's really what you had happening in, in the Old Testament. You had, you had just example after example after example of unbelief. But, but, but really, the, the whole thing is, um, is, as far as they never received the promises, uh, the physical descendants of Abraham never received his blessing, and they never will. Uh, they were living by faith when they died, yet none of them received what was promised because God had something better planned for us so that only together with us could they ever be made perfect. That's what Hebrews says there. So they were a model. They were a shadow. Abraham's family, um, the Israelites, were a shadow of the true Israel, us, the Israel of God, as we're referred to in as in Galatians. The true children of Abraham have now been revealed. So, my opinion on it, but let's take that and kind of go back to these scriptures now that mention adoption to sonship and see if that works, if we plug that in to these. So jumping back, and I always have to like figure out what tab I was on here. Okay, so jumping back here, the first mention. Uh, so the first mention, Romans 8, 15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry out, Abba, Father. Okay. So Abraham's promise, his blessing, is to receive the Holy Spirit. We've done, we've received the Holy Spirit because we believed in Jesus. So now the Spirit that's within us cries out, Abba, Father. Um, the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. We are the children of God. In my opinion, that's not us being adopted into God's family. That's us receiving Abraham's blessing, his promise. We're receiving that the Holy Spirit. We're born into God's family. I'm going to cover that here in a second. Uh, I don't think it's, no, we're not adopted where we have, we're still our old, we're still pretty much our old selves. We're just, you know, we changed our last name, but um, this is actually being brought into what was promised to Israel. We're being brought into that, you know, and, and we're actually receiving what Israel was originally promised, but they didn't have any faith. And this only came through faith. These blessings only came through faith. Uh, so we're receiving those things. We're brought in there. We're sitting in Israel's place now. Um, and the spirit that's within us is crying out, Abba, Father. And he's testifying that we are the true children of God. We're, we're God's children. We're Abraham's children. We're the recipients of his promise. When God made his promise to Abraham, and he said that your descendants, um, if you can count the sand on the seashore, look at the stars. He says, if you can count them, then that's how many descendants you're going to have. That was never speaking about Israel. The, the physical, yes, he's going to have lots of physical children. It was never speaking about them. This was talking about the new creation that was coming in Christ. That's what that was all about. That was about the children of God, not the children of Israel, the children of God, who are anyone who places their faith in Jesus Christ. We are that. We are the stars in the sky. We are the sand on the seashore. That was all talking about us. Um, we've received that now. We've received that. Now, this has now been fulfilled. The promise of Abraham has now been fulfilled. And really, our, our numbers are growing daily, so it's being fulfilled too. And you could say it's fulfilled. You could say it's being fulfilled because more and more are coming in all the time. So now when he goes down here to verse 23 and he says, um, not only, uh, let me read the whole context here. Um, we know that all of creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. So creation is groaning because it's in subjugation to decay is what he's talking about. And it's because of Adam, it's because of Adam's sin. So all of creation is decaying. And then he goes on and he says, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we await for our, eagerly await our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So if we team this up with some of Paul's other teachings, this does make a lot of sense. Talking about now we who have received the adoption of sonship have the Holy Spirit, okay? Now the Holy Spirit who gives life will also give life to our mortal bodies, will also regenerate our mortal bodies. That hasn't happened yet. We have the first fruits of the new creation. We are the new creation. We are. Because really, we're not we're not really physical necessarily. Like, oh no, I got a call here. Let me clear that notification. We're not really physical. We're actually we're actually spiritual. Well, you know, we're the us, ourselves, um, we're, we're spirit, we have a new heart, a new spirit, and we are in a physical body. Um, but what we, the promises that we have in scripture is that though this physical body is going to age and die, um, it actually says because of sin. And not that we have sin, because we don't. The blood of Jesus purged us from all sin, so we don't have sin. We are still going to age and die as an effect of sin. 
That is because this physical body has not yet been made new. I have, so like, just kind of like looking at me, and you're, you would be an example of this too. I have been made new. I have a new heart and a new spirit. Um, and I have the Holy Spirit living within me. I am a new creation, me. My physical body is not, not yet, will happen. That will happen. The redemption of our bodies, the freedom of our bodies from decay, that will happen. That hasn't happened yet. God has testified to that by already making us new spirit, new heart. He's, he's testified that he's given us the Holy Spirit as deposit. He's saying, I'm good on this. I'm good on this word. Said I'm going to do it. I am going to do it. You can see that because I've already made you new. Another thing about the new creation, which is us, you know, the new creation in Christ, we are a testament to the damnation of the devil and his demons. Um, we are a testament that everything will eventually be made new. We're the first fruits, as Paul is saying. We're the first fruits of this coming new creation that's going to be everything. It's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, new physical bodies for us. Um, everything is going to be made new. We're testifying. We are walking testaments to that because we've already been made new. That's what the first fruit is. It's like the first fruit of a harvest. That's, that's the metaphor that's being used there. It shows up a ton in the Old Testament. The, there was a festival of first fruits. You got to bring your first fruits in. These are the first products of your harvest. Uh, that's us. There's a harvest coming. We are the first fruits of that. We're the first products of that. Those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. So uh, like all the Jewish festivals and everything in the law, the festival of the first fruits points forward. It points forward to, you know, in this it's physical fruit, it's physical vegetables, and that's because harvest time is coming. Um, harvest time is a horrible thing for the devil to think of and the demons to think of, okay? Because harvest time is not going to be a happy time for him. Um, the first fruits have already been produced. We're already here, meaning it's not going to be long till the harvest. He knows that. He knows his time is short. Revelation says that. He knows He knows that's all coming. Here we are, the children of God, and we're waiting for the redemption of our bodies. We're waiting for it to be freed from, finally, from, from this physical decay. Um, that hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. God's good on that. He made a promise. It's going to happen. We just don't know when, but it's going to happen. Um, that's, that's what that means in Romans, in Romans 8, 25. So it's a little bit of a different definition, but it's kind of the same. Because the adoption to sonship is you're receiving the Holy Spirit. Now this is a description of what that's going to be like. Um, you, you have the Holy Spirit, but just as he gave, just as um, God raised Christ from the dead, he'll also give life to our mortal bodies uh, by his Spirit. So that's, that's what that is. It's strange that Paul would have used that, those same words there. I think this is why Peter later on, when he's talking about Paul's scriptures, he says they contain things that are hard to understand that unstable people twist and distort. Probably stuff like this. Because without, especially if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you know, you know, like, especially if you don't have the Holy Spirit, I mean, this is, oh gosh, Paul, like why? Why not, why not flesh this out a little bit more here? So anyway, uh, so that's the second one. Now let's look at the third one here. So this is Romans 9, 4, and this is talking about the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Now, what we define is that there's two, there's two adoptions to sonship. There's the model, the shadow, which was being a physical descendant of Abraham, and there's the reality, which is being a spiritual descendant of Abraham, the true one. Everything real is spiritual. Everything that's a shadow is physical. That's a theme throughout the whole Bible. Everything that's a shadow always has a physical representation. There's always a physical... It's like, it's like God is almost putting on... You know how when you get a new job, you watch these, these, um, these silly instructional videos that'll, that'll show you like um, examples of things that might happen in the future. It's like that. It's like God, th like the Old Testament's like like his um, his employee handbook a little bit. Like these are these are models of what's coming. These are models of of something that has yet to happen. In the, in our case, it has happened because we're you now we've had the, all the fulfillment of all that with Christ. But but you have a whole thirty nine books full of shadows of models of demonstrations, and Israel is a model. They're a model of the true Israel which is us, the, the Israel of God, is what Galatians says about, about the, new, the new covenant, the new creation, um, the children of God. That's us. We're, we're the true, we're the true, we're the reality that they were pointing to. Now, they're welcome to join. They're welcome to join the reality. That's, they're not excluded from that, but they don't believe. And you have to have faith in order to join, in order to be uh, grafted in uh, is, is, is the true Israel. So, uh, but, th but that's what this is. So their adoption of sonship is not the same thing. That's, that's the old covenant adoption of sonship, not what we have in Christ. 
Going down to our next mention here, and this kind of ties into this because it's, Galatians 4, 5 is talking about the Israelites, and it's saying that they were under the law, but Christ came under the law so that they could receive adoption as sonship. Paul's not contradicting himself. He's talking about the real adoption of sonship, the true one, the receiving the Holy Spirit. John says in his gospel, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus is talking about living water. Nobody understands him. And John actually explains it. I, lo I love the way John writes because he, he does explain these things. He puts in the, like, the little parentheses, um, things that I wish Paul had done. But he explains and he says, By this Jesus meant the Holy Spirit who was later to come on those who had believed. And then he says, Up until that time, no one had received the Holy Spirit because Christ had not yet been glorified. So John explains all that right there. So Jesus is talking in a metaphor. He's saying living water. It's obviously not actual water. This is talking about the Holy Spirit who is to come later. After, after Jesus has died, he's come back to life. He's going to send the gift that his father promised to everyone who will believe in him, which is the Holy Spirit. When did his father promise it? To Abraham. When he said, through your seed, um, through, through you and your seed, all peoples on earth will be blessed. That's when he promised it. Jesus is now delivering that gift that was promised so long ago. So, so, th so that's what Galatians 4, 5 is talking about, that the Israelites needed to receive that. Uh, they did. They did because the law couldn't save them. That, if, if the New Testament screams anything from the rooftops is that the law saves no one. No one will ever be declared righteous by the works of the law. It cannot happen. Um, you must believe in Jesus Christ to be righteous. That's it. Never could be by anything you did. You could keep 99% of the law and you if that were such a thing were possible, which I don't believe, but let's say you even got pretty far with keeping the law, wouldn't matter. You have to keep all of it. You have to keep it perfectly and forever. And you cannot do that. Uh, no one can do that. It's That was the point of that. The law was given so that sin would increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So, and then the final mention of, of um, being adopted into sonship, receiving the adoption of sonship, I didn't talk about this one earlier. And that's because I wanted to end this this uh, end this conversation with this mention. This is the final mention of it in scripture. It comes from Ephesians. It's talking about the Gentiles in this, largely. Largely talking about the Gentiles in Ephesians. But Ephesians is a book that uh, explains how the Jews and the Gentiles were actually brought together by the blood of Christ. They were brought, brought into one new humanity, is what Ephesians chapter 2 says. But talking again, kind of to Gentiles, it could be to Jews too, but really, I, I really believe that this is more or less to the Gentiles. It says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, and to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one that he loves. Ephesians is a beautiful book. Absolutely beautiful. It's the most like in Christ book in the New Testament. Uh, just goes on and on and on about it. This is who you are. You know, it's just absolutely beautiful scripture. It rivals Hebrews. I still put Hebrews above it, but it rivals Hebrews. So, uh, but, but at any rate, uh, predestination is being talked about now. Okay, so now predestination and adoption to sonship is being linked. That is because, in my opinion, Jeremiah's opinion, they are darn near the same thing. The adoption to sonship is the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's, that's what that is. That's the real one predestination is that everyone, all peoples, were predestined to eventually receive the Holy Spirit when, through the coming of Christ. All people, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's really the only way predestination is, is defined. It only shows up a couple of times. I know we've made all kinds of wacky doctrines out of it, but the only way it's really ever defined is being Abraham's promise that all people would be blessed through Abraham. That's predestination. All people were predestined. That's not universalism, because all people, although they're all predestined to receive that adoption to sonship, they were all predestined for that, all peoples will be blessed, they still need to look to the Son of God and believe in him. Everyone has the opportunity. There are no prerequisites uh, to, okay, well, these people do, these people don't. Uh, none, none of that junk. Everyone can look to the Son and believe in him and have eternal life. And Jesus himself will raise them up in the last day. He says that. Uh, that's the will of God. That is the will of God. That's the only definition of the will of God, is that you look to the Son and believe in him. All people have that opportunity because of Jesus. All the Both groups, the Jews and Gentiles, Ephesians chapter 2 says, have been brought together by the blood of Christ. They're one new humanity. That one new humanity needs only to look to the Son and believe in him. They will have eternal life. The Holy Spirit will come to rest upon them. They will be a new creation. 
That's what predestination is. Predestination and the adoption of sonship, like I said, and it's my opinion, are darn near the same thing. It's this adoption to sonship, the true children of Abraham, by faith, anyone who has faith is a child of Abraham, is also the peoples who will be blessed through Abraham. It's darn near the same thing. It's a different way of saying it, but it's darn near the same thing. The only way, like I was saying, that predestination is ever defined. This idea of the elect and the non-elect, and there's only certain people who could ever believe in Jesus Christ and have faith and be saved, and then there's people who can't, is man-made gobbledygook. Shows up nowhere in Scripture. They, they pull it from Romans. I mean, I know where it comes from, but it's not... It's a terrible interpretation of that. It adds monstrous qualities to God, who he's not a good father under that. He's, he's actually a bad one. It would be like... It would be like if you had two kids and one of them you accepted and the other one you hated. You know, one of them, you wanted, the other one you just, you know, didn't care about at all. Like one of them you really loved, the other one you just discarded. I mean, that's, you're, there's so many things that you would have to change about the gospel to get this idea of certain people have been predestined to ascend. And that's that. Now, scripture does say, Jesus, actually, this is in the gospel of John. It says Jesus already knew ahead of time who would believe in him. Uh, that is in the Gospel of John. And that's, of course, true because he's God. He knows everything. He knows ahead of time those who are going to believe in him. That's not predestination. Um, he's opened the door to the kingdom of heaven to absolutely everyone. Absolutely everyone. Um, he's the gate. You need to enter through him, he says. But he's opened the doors wide open. Believe in the Son and you will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's it. Just look to Jesus and believe in him. Um, but he does know who's going to do that and who isn't. That's not predestination. That's just him being God. That's, that's, he, there's no scenario in which he couldn't know that. In which, which he, if, he can't, if we ever say God can't, we've gone wrong. God cannot, we've gone wrong. Um, that's God can, plural, like with everything present. He can and he does. Um, but he has opened the door to everyone. I have a friend of mine who um, is, is in that belief system but doesn't like that idea almost because then he says, okay, but why would God ever create somebody who he knows isn't going to believe in him? Why would he ever do that? Um, and he even said, he went a little further with it. He said, you know, God, God creates people knowing that they're not going to, they're not going to believe in him. And he also created a trash can to put them in. Um, you know, and he, he went a little further with that. And there's all kinds of things. We could do a whole live stream on hell, which we should do. We should do that. I'd, I'd like to do that. Um, and I understand that. I understand that thinking. I, I really do. But again, God is not making that decision for them. He has done everything to ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, he's not sending anyone to hell, to shield now, but hell later. He's not doing that. Um, unbelief on an individual level is what sends somebody there. I'm refusing, although they knew God, Romans says, they have refused to acknowledge him as God. Um, that's what sends them there, is that unbelief, that hardness, that hater of God that's described in the beginning of Romans. It's not, God isn't doing that. He's, he's, not, he's not determining that. He's, again, he's opened the door. The Holy Spirit, his job is to convict the world of sin. He will be doing that that person's entire life. He'll be convicting them of sin, trying to get them to repent, trying to get them to change their mind on that and to repent toward grace. But, you know, that's, again, that's their decision. That's, that's up. That's on them. That's not on him. Um, you know, that, that's, that, so, so it's, it is kind of, I, I understand that. I understand not liking that, but that's really, that's just what scripture says about it. That's just what, that's just what we have, you know, there. Um, I understand not liking it. I don't really have a problem with it, to be honest with you guys. It's not like, um, I don't, I don't see that reflecting poorly on God in any way, shape or form. If he really wanted to create people just to be destroyed, he would not have sent his son, um, you know, he, he would not have done that. Uh, he, would, he, would not, he wouldn't have done everything he, he had done if that was really his agenda. Um, the, the coming of Jesus Christ was to prevent this very thing that we're kind of charging him with and saying that like, oh, he's, he's just, you know, he's a divine person up there pulling the strings. It's like, he no, no. If he wanted to do that, he would do that. But he's not doing that. Um, he's done the opposite of that. So, all right. Um, those are my thoughts on adoption of sonship and everything we talked about. Let me jump to your comments. I saw there was a few of them. Good morning, Manuel. Good morning, Amber. Um, so Manuel, uh, you mentioned this. I did touch on it earlier. I'm going to touch on it here again, uh, just briefly. Grafted in. Um, will being grafted uh, kind of be the same? Is that adoption of sonship? Yes. So when 
when uh, Romans, I think it's chapter nine, that talks about being grafted into the to um, really where Israel used to be. They were cut out of this of this uh, vine. It's almost like a vine in the branches metaphor. It's kind of similar almost to John fifteen, but Israel was cut out. We were grafted in. If they have faith, they'll be grafted in again, um, because it's all about faith. So it is kind of the same to be a child of Abraham, the true children of Abraham. It's by faith. It's those who share the faith of Abraham, and same with. Being a child of God, it's all faith. It's all faith in Jesus Christ. Um, that's how that happens. So it's it's all about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. But that's why people stumble because it's because it is so simple. Because it is there's just one way. There's just one thing to do to believe in the Son of God. That's it. Uh, that's all. But that's why it's offensive. The, the cross is offensive. Scripture says um, that's why it's foolishness. Scripture calls it that. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Uh, it says that as well. And Jesus is referred to as the stumbling block. It says the stone you builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And it's a stone that makes them stumble. Um, a rock which makes them fall. Because it's so simple. It's all one person. But that's hard. That's hard to understand that. It's hard It's hard for those kind of those religious minds to, to hear that. So, all right. Uh, let me go down to this. Um, Amber says, yes, shadow to reality. Yes, that's really what we have in, in the Old Testament. It's just a bunch, bunch of shadows, a bunch of models pointing to a reality. Um, okay, I feel like religion often uses first fruits to to pressure people into tithing. <laughs> oh no, honor God with your first fruits. Well, that's completely out of context. If they're doing that and they're saying that we need to be, and if and especially if they're going to the Old Testament with the festival of first fruits and everything like that, which I'm gonna imagine that that's what they're gonna do, or they'll at least pull them out of um, some some out of context scripture out of the New Testament about first fruits. Uh, that's that's really um, terrible. If that's what we're doing, because that that's actually taking the finished work of Christ, us, the first fruits of the new creation, and twisting it into some terrible narrative that it's not. Um, that's not being respectful to the cross. That's not being respectful to Jesus if we're doing that. That's that's horrible. That's horrible. There's a very specific way that that's used. And if they're saying like, oh, you need to bring your first fruits to God, um, that's old covenant, first of all. And uh, new covenant, we are the first fruits. So us being in Christ is that it's the fulfillment of what we saw in the old so that would I, it doesn't surprise me that that would be used that why not why not why not turn that into a tithe you know why not turn it into a work but th thankfully scripture does not <laughs> define it that way um okay uh, he says i got family that i can't explain the truth of giving or tithing and they won't tell me that i'm wrong but they're just so stuck in their ways to each his own i guess uh, yeah some stuff i I, I feel you on that. Some stuff I just let go to, you know, it's like I, I try to explain some stuff, you know, I'll try to like, say like, look, I mean, we don't have, let's see, pick a tithe. I don't think I've had that conversation with it. I think I have actually with a 10% tithe, but, um, we can say, look, um, we don't have that in the new Testament. We, we just simply don't, we don't have that anywhere in the new Testament. So what do we make of that? Why, why are we teaching this as doctrine? What are we doing here? Um, but if they reject it and they say, look, I'm going to, I'm going to give 10% and they, I mean, I hope they don't believe that's going to do something for them because it just isn't, uh, it, it just isn't, uh, you know, we have in second Corinthians, God loves a cheerful giver, not one who does it under compulsion. And if we're not that he doesn't, I, I think I, I mean, I misquoted that. Let me, let me say that again. It's not that he doesn't love someone who gives under compulsion. It does not say that it says we should give cheerfully, not under compulsion. We shouldn't be giving under compulsion. It never says he doesn't love someone who does that. So make sure to clarify that. But compulsion is not what is desired in the in the new covenant. It's not when it comes to giving. It's not it's not desired. And unfortunately compulsion is probably mostly what we have in our churches. It's mostly that. It's give and then it's give to get. It's give to get. Oh you can't out give God. I saw a funny quote. This is on Facebook. Uh, this is a Freedom in Christ admin put this. And I'm not gonna quote him exactly because I don't remember it exactly, but it was something kind of funny. And he put in quotation marks, he put, you can't outgive God. And he said, and he's talking about people that are always talking, always saying that. And he says, really? He's like, if that's the case, go and sell everything you own, give it away to the poor, and then teach me that I can't outgive God. And it's just kind of funny. I just, I just thought it was kind of funny because I was like, he's like, live it, you know, live up to it then. You know, you're, you're going around telling everybody that you're accepting their money. Um, act like it then act it, you know, it's really act like you believe that because you, because you don't, you know, it's, it's a bad philosophy. We don't, we don't see that in, in the New Testament that you can't outgive God. There's no verse that says that. And it's not that, it's not that God, that that couldn't be the case, 
that you know you could give up you could give a ton and then God's going to it's not that that can't be the case it's that God doesn't say he's going to do that that's the problem with it um he never he never made you a promise that he's going to um you know multiply your storehouses or whatever we're getting from Malachi he he never he didn't say that to you um we're incorrectly taking scripture from Israel and we're applying that to us uh so so really you know that, that's that's such a dangerous thing. That's such a dangerous thing. That's such a kind of a false thing to put in people's minds. Um, it's not that it's not that God isn't good on His word. It's that He did not promise that to to New Covenant Christians. That that's the problem with that. We're we're putting words in God's mouth. So uh, going on here, um, I've heard that elect and non elect pre. I've heard that non elect and and non elect preaching at church. I in a church I visited, all I could think of the entire sermon was John three sixteen. Yeah, the he loved the world, right? He so loved the world, not, well, he loved parts of it. He loved his favorites. He loved the elect. He didn't love the non-elect. Um, he hated them, actually. Well, doesn't scripture say in Malachi, uh, Jacob that I, I loved, but Esau I hated? Um, we, we use that, too. Talking, of course, about Jews and Gentiles there, not about predestination. The context of that, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated, Jacob is representing what I mean what's Jacob's other name? Israel. Israel. Israel have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Um God is first of all, Malachi is a complaint against the Jews for violation of the old covenant, specifically the tithe, actually, but there's other things in there as well. Do you know the last word in the Old Testament is curse? Lest I come and strike the land with a curse. Lights out. That's the end of the Old Testament. And no word sums up the Old Testament better than that, than curse. Um but that's how it ends. It ends with God threatening that he's going to come strike the land with a curse because they're not keeping the old covenant. Then the next, you kind of flip the page, you know, and then the next thing is like the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. <laughs> Here's the Messiah. But but that's really how it ends. It ends that way. That's the threat that's in Malachi. Um, but when, when he says that, when he says, Jacob, have I loved Esau that I, have I hated? We look at that and we say, oh, well, there you go. He loved some people and he hated other people. Jacob is representing the Jews. Esau is representing the Gentiles. Um, God was nearly exclusively, but not exclusively, doing all his dealings with the nation of Israel, his chosen people, his people, the people of God. Um, he's saying, I've loved you. Um, I've loved you, but you have not loved me. And he's going on about that. And he said, I've excluded Esau. I've excluded the Gentiles. I've chosen you, and you've not been faithful to me. And that's the context there. It has nothing to do with... Uh, predestination, who can be saved and who can't be saved. That's such a silly inter interpretation of that. That's, that, that is just like, I, I know that it's old. It's like 600 years old now that we've been interpreting it that way. But that's just, I mean, come on. It, just, it, doesn't, it doesn't, it's not talking about that. So it's, it says that because we want it to say it. That's, that's a lot of things are like that. Um, Amber says they have the opportunity to reject. Yes, they do. Uh, but they, but they have the opportunity to be saved equally. You know they have the, this is they they have it. They can look to the Son and believe in Him. They can do that, uh, but they don't do that. And that's they can do that, but they don't do that. But that's not God being unfair. That's not Him being selective. Um, that is Him calling. You know G Jesus says, "When the Son of Man is raised up, I will draw all people to Myself." Um, he does that, but not all people believe in Him. So. Um, who sends one to prison, the judge or the criminals? That's a very good point. Uh, that's that's a very uh, good point, Manuel. Who who's who does? You know, as as far as like when you, when somebody goes to prison, who is actually putting them there? Is the judge doing that, or is the criminal's actions putting them there? That's a very good point because that that is that is what we have. It's not it's not the judge. It's not not his fault. In fact, he's done everything to pardon that. Um, but if they don't believe, you know, you have to believe in the Son of God. You have to do that. So, um, up north, good morning. Um, he's, I've heard someone explain how tithing is still actually a sin because it's not of faith. I, if you're giving based on rules, I guess. Um, whatever is not of faith is sin. It's interesting because, what is that Romans 14 that says that, I think? Is it? I think it is. Um, but regardless, when we see that, it's talking about weak faith. And weak faith is the only definition of weak faith, we've threatened our brothers and sisters with that, you know, left, right, up, and down, but the only definition of weak faith is actually, it's actually observing small portions of the law because it was talking about um, some people consider certain things clean and unclean, and um, but that's actually referred to as weaker faith, kind of still sticking to that.
That's it. It's, 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 it's basically observing some kind of a tradition. So is it sin if you're going to the law? Because the law is not of faith. The law is not of faith. Scripture says that as well. If you're going to the law, you're grabbing the tithe incorrectly, mind you, because you're not actually taking the entire number. You're taking 10%. So you got the 10% tithe from the law. And then you're doing that out of compulsion. It's not out of faith. It's out of compulsion. Is that sin? Um, probably. It's not of faith. It's not of faith. I probably. I, I I don't know. I would have to. You would have to ask God about that. Um, I kind of think so. It sounds like it would be. It sounds like it would be. Especially if you're doing it as a give to get. Especially if that's really. If you know. And, and not. We can be lied to though. See that's that's where it makes it hard. You know if we have a pastor up there lying about that and lying and telling us we have to do that and and then God's going to bless us if we do. Um, that might be a little different if we're being deceived and then we do that. That's not really us acting not out of faith. Unfortunately, it's us acting out of faith in the pastor. Um, but I don't know if it's if that would really be the same thing. But I think that if we, if we were somebody who was doing that maybe on our own and on, on of our own accord and we're going to the law and we're doing that and we think that this is something we have to do based... You know, that might actually be sin because that's not of faith. But again, we'd have to ask God about that. I don't know. I don't know. It kind of sounds like it, though. <laughs> kind of sounds like it would be. Um, Amber says, the motives of the heart in regards to giving, I think that's the issue. Uh, prob probably. Probably. It just it depends on where you're at. Like, what, what is your motive? Um, what, why are you doing this? You know, why, why are you doing this? Um, because if it's not of faith, it is sin. Anything that's not of faith is sin. But we do walk by faith as the children of God. Um, we do walk by faith. Um, we So I don't think that's something we need to necessarily be like, super concerned about like, Oh, well, if I didn't do this out of faith or didn't do that out of faith, uh, yes, but we walk by faith. Um, but then you can be deceived, but on top of that, you can be, that's a good subject. Maybe we should talk about that in the live stream. Like what, what does that all entail? The anything that not of faith is sin is observing the law sin. Um, Paul says the law isn't sin. Is the law sin? No, far from it. The law is holy, righteous, and good, but is observing the law out of compulsion and out of fear actually sin? I, I kind of lean toward maybe because you're you're negating the Son of God by doing that. You're treating it, it kind of almost is an is a manifestation of unbelief a little bit. I, I don't know. See, and that's the thing. I, I don't want to you know say things that I that I shouldn't. That's what's funny. That's what the, the you know they always run that that well, when you do when you do live streams. I'm just I'm just kind of thinking this out loud here. Um, I'm just kind of thinking this out loud here, but uh, I don't know. That, let's let's talk about that. Maybe we can talk about that tomorrow. I'll have to I'll have to put put my thoughts together on that. Is is observing the law for the wrong reasons actually sin? Is that actually sin? Oh, maybe that's a solid maybe. I'll I'll have, I'll, I'll research it and then maybe uh, give an opinion on that later this week. An official one, not me just like whatever's coming to the top of my head here. Um, yes, uh, yeah. They are sometimes you get you get tithing messages that are just to yeah to. We need new carpet in the sanctuary. You, you do get that a lot too, unfortunately. You get a terrible misuse of that. It's hard to say. I mean, I've never ran a church. Like I've never been in that hot seat, you know, where we you don't have enough money and now we know what you do. I, I, I can tell you what I wouldn't do though. And, and and it's hard to say, you know, you're speaking out of from an outside perspective, it's easy to have all the answers from a distance. Um, so I don't want to say something ignorant. I've never been in that position. I've never been in that position where I'm in charge of a church. I'm trying to get it to run and we're not getting enough money. But I... I can't imagine using fear and out of context scripture as a motivator. I, I just can't imagine that uh, doing that. That's so wrong. It's predatory almost to do that. Unless you really don't know, unless you're just ignorant and you really don't know, you shouldn't be doing that. And you've been so indoctrinated that you think that's what you should do. I, I don't know. That's that's a scary place. Uh, Manuel says, "Was Adam Jewish? Uh, no, he wasn't." So. I'll, I'll, um, I'll uh, get this really uh, quick here and then we can end. Um, no, Adam wouldn't have been Jewish. The Jewish nation would have officially been born when uh, when the law was given to Moses on, on Mount Sinai. That's really the establishment of the Jewish nation. Abraham, so there's two different, there's two different words. So you have Hebrew and you have Jew. Um, you have Jew. Judaism is specifically following the law. It's, it's those who were under the law. That's Judaism. Being a Hebrew, Abraham is actually referred to as a Hebrew. And that's because just a couple descendants up from him, there's a gentleman named Hebri, if I'm pronouncing that right, or Hebrae. 
and descendants of this Hebrite or Hebri were referred to as Hebrews. That's where that comes from. So although when the, when the people of Israel were in Egypt, they were referred to as Hebrews, and that's because they're descendants of this Hebri Hebre. Let's just call them Hebre. That's probably easier. So they're descendants of Hebre, and that's why they're Hebrews. Judaism comes from the law, and that, come, that came 430 years later. So a long, long time after Adam. So no, Adam wasn't anything. He wasn't Jewish. He wasn't a Hebrew. He was just a man. He was actually referred to as the son of God in, um, in Luke, uh, lowercase s. But, but God is his origin point. He has no ancestry, no, no mother or father, no genealogy. He's just the son of God, uh, similar to Jesus. But Jesus is capital S, son of God. Adam is lowercase s, son of God. Um, so that's, that's a good question, though. It's a good, that's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll just get these really quick here. I know we're going a little long. And anyone who tries to... Uh, Sarah, good morning, first of all. Sorry. <laughs> and anyone who uh, tries to follow the law always picks and chooses because it's impossible. And then Paul says you have to follow all of it. Um, yes, but we don't like that part, though. We, we don't like the part where he's... Where, you know, James says, for anyone who keeps the entire law but stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Uh, we don't like that. You know, we, we don't like that. Uh, those parts. We like the parts where we can make it be whatever parts of the law we want. That, that's what we like. Uh, there's a lot of inconvenient scripture for that, that partial following of the law. Uh, we center around giving dollars to a building, and there's so much more we can give attention to. Love listening to people. We cross paths with our daily life. You know, giving in general does not have to be monetary. Uh, you could give your time. And time, my goodness, time time is valuable. You know, if, if you're giving your time, and you're, you know, whatever it is you're doing, and really just, just living... Um, just being yourself and in Christ living through you and you being his ambassador, um, you're always you're always ministering. You're you are. You're always ministering. Whether it feels like it or not, you are. Um, you are always ministering. You are a competent minister of the new covenant. That's your job. You're always doing that, but it's not a job to where, oh you know, crap, is it five o'clock yet? You know, it's it's not that kind of a job. It's this is your this is who you are. You're a competent minister of a new covenant. Um so so, you know, if you're giving your time, if you're giving your energy, I mean, that's that's giving. It does not have to be monetary. It can be monetary. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. A lot of us don't have resources to give monetarily. My wife and I don't. We don't give, we don't give money. I actually do, unfortunately. Um, I give money to Caleb, and that's because I started doing that a long time ago, and I just have never made that call to cancel that donation. Uh, my wife did, because we, we started... We were all excited about K-Love until we started to understand grace, and then we started to hear these interludes with these pastors that are preaching just a terrible mixed message on there. Terrible, terrible, horrible mixed messages come on that station. So I'm still funding that, incidentally, and that's just because I have not made the call to uh, cancel that. No no hard feelings against K-Love or anything. We still have it on sometimes, but I don't want to put money toward that. That's, that's where I'm at with it. But I am. Every month, I'm putting money toward it, so... Got to actually make that call at some point. But all right, guys. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, sharing your thoughts. I really appreciate it. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about this. The adoption to sonship, uh, you know, what anything that we talked about today, it's dense. It's, it's dense. And it's and, and thank, thank you, Paul, for defining this five different ways for us. Um, but uh, I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Maybe we'll talk about, you know, what is not a faith is sin. Maybe we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. So, but thanks so much, guys. Talk to you soon. Bye.